Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, friends. I have the pleasure of welcoming you to today's celebration of Ra II's 50th anniversary. And as you see, I'm the president of the board of the Contiki Museum. And in my work life, I'm a social anthropologist. I work as a professor at the University of Oslo. And my speciality is the Pacific. That's why I work here also. As some of you might know, it is Thor Heyerdahl's birthday today also. He was born on the 6th of October in 1914, so that makes him 116 years old today. So we have a lot to celebrate. And I'm very pleased that you could all come. And we hope that later on, when there is not such a pandemic situation, we can invite more people so we can have more contact with you all and the groups that you represent. This is Ra 2, as you see. Uh, the first read boat, the Ra, uh, not Ra 1, but Ra, <laughs> was abandoned approximately one week sailing from completing the crossing. And this happened because, as always, the safety of the crew was of utmost importance for Thor Heyerdahl. He did not put making it or completing the voyage above the safety of his crew. So I'll, uh, uh, I think that's important. Ra 2 went from Safi in Morocco on the 17th of May in seven, 1970 and reached Bridgetown, Barbados, 12th of July, uh, same year. So the journey covered 6,100 kilometers in 57 days. And the difference between the first voyage and the second and more successful one in terms of actually reaching the shore was a shorter construction. And most importantly, as you saw in the previous photo, Thur Heyerdahl had studied the way that boats were constructed in Egypt and other places. And there was a little thing that he hadn't really understood the importance of, and that was the tether of the stern that pulled the stern up, and it made it uh, more seaworthy. It was in the ancient drawings, but he, they hadn't quite understood the importance of that detail. So it shows that uh, also theoretical studies can be of importance, but you have to try it out to see what works and what doesn't work. This vessel, as you can see out here, was built out of 12 tons of papyrus reed, and it was lashed into two thick and one thin bundle. And uh, the reeds were from Ethiopia, Lake Tana. Ratu was built by four Ayamara Indians living on the Sirkoi Island on Lake Titicaca in Bolivia. Demetrio, Jose, and Juma Juan Limachi and Paulino Esteban. And the living culture, the traditions of building these boats were also kept by builders from Chad. So it's, uh, it was a way of creating boats that existed in more than one place. So reed boats, as we can see from this picture, were known on both sides of the Atlantic and Heyerdahl wanted to test the Atlantic as a conveyor. And he wanted to, of course, test the seaworthiness of such an ancient vessel, not just on journeys close to the shore, but across land. Finally, he wanted to show the world that international cooperation, crossing barriers of languages, religion, and ideologies were possible and that, at least on this little floating world, people could cooperate and live peacefully. Eight people of different nationalities, as you can see here, made up the crew. Norman Baker from USA, Carlo Mauri from Italy, Yuri Senkevich from Russia, George Surial from Egypt, Santiago Genovese from Mexico, Kei Ohara from Japan, and Madani Ait Ohane from Morocco, 
and Thor Heyerdahl from Norway, who was the expedition leader and captain. The uh, man from Chad, he was just on the first journey, so uh, that's why I didn't mention him on this day. Thor Heyerdahl's perhaps most important reminder to us today, in my opinion at least, lies in his understanding and appreciation of the skills of other cultures, in this case prehistoric cultures as some scholars call them. And we at the Kontiki Museum are very happy to be able to remind our contemporary visitors that great achievements demand peaceful cooperation and contact across cultural divides. So I will now give the word to Thor Heyerdahl's son, Thor Heyerdahl Jr., who was present at the launching of Ratu in Safi. Thank you. Your Excellencies, dear friends, first, thank you so much for honoring us by your uh, presence. We appreciate that very much. It's my father's birthday. He would have been 106. Six. Six. How many? 106. That all? <laughs> I'm approaching him. <laughs> uh, although I bear his name, I'm not a clone of my father. I'm also the son of my mother. And I'm just as proud of that. Uh, I'll just uh, add uh, one personal experience uh, to uh, what you just uh, heard. Uh, the first Ra expedition in 69, the same year when uh, Neil Armstrong set his foot on the face of the moon, uh, they made it almost to Barbados, but not quite. Uh, the crew wanted to continue, but the boat or raft, whatever we call it, uh, was more or less falling apart. It was poorly uh, built. Uh, uh, but it was in a shape that uh, wouldn't have, with a, uh, or, uh, with a hurricane, and this was the beginning of the hurricane uh, season, uh, the crew wanted to gamble. My father, being responsible for the expedition and all the men's lives, uh, decided no, uh, we... Uh, we abandon ship, abandon boat. It's not worth risking uh, our lives. So they repeated uh, the expedition the following year with the raft that you just uh, that we have on exhibit here. Uh, at this time, I was a so-called assistant professor of marine uh, biology, oceanography at a fishery college up in in northern uh, Norway. So locally, I was known as an expert on marine uh, life. So three years after uh, the first raw had been uh, deserted, a fisherman approached me uh, and uh, he brought a, a three meter long straw uh, and he said that, well, Heyerdahl, well, what is this? I've never seen the likes of it uh, before. It was washed ashore on the windward side of the Lofoten Islands up in uh, northern Norway. What, what, can, what can this be? I recognized it immediately. It had a triangular uh, cross section and there were uh, traces of the lashings. So uh, no doubt it was a papyrus uh, read from the Ra. That after the Ra had been uh, uh, deserted, they, uh, the reeds continued uh, past the Windward Islands into the Caribbean, and then between Yucatan and Cuba into the Gulf of 
Mexico, you're all familiar with the geography, <laughs> and then squeezed out between Florida and Cuba, brought uh, with a Gulf Stream, three years later, washed ashore in the Lofoten uh, Islands. Uh, proving, uh, well, again, just uh, showing that what we all know from our geography lessons that, that the uh, ocean currents are like rivers, they tie the continents uh, together. Uh, but more important, uh, there was nothing wrong with the buoyancy of the papyrus. It was still capable of floating. It was, the raft was simply poorly built. So uh, the Ra uh, two was built by Aymara uh, Indians from Lake Titicaca, and they were professional boat uh, builders. So uh, with the Ra two, they sailed elegantly uh, across the Atlantic into the harbor of uh, Barbados. And um, uh, yeah, that's what I wanted to say. Uh, why uh, we have a raw two uh, in the museum here. The raw one is spread all over from northern Norway and, and, and down to uh, Morocco, I believe it came back. Uh, and then a few comments on this uh, photograph. This is uh, Madani from your country, Morocco. Uh, he was, uh, well, one, one day my father dipped his toothbrush into the ocean to brush his teeth. And he discovered a lump of oil on his brush. Had it been me, I would have sweared in uh, juicy Norwegian. But my father, he complained to Secretary General Utant of the United <laughs> Nations. So, and uh, <laughs> at that time, <clears throat> I was responsible for monitoring, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, oil pollution in the world oceans, um, uh, gathering uh, reports from all over the world. We knew pretty well uh, how much uh, oil yearly is spilled into the sea. Uh, at that time, around uh, 10 million uh, tons the equivalent of Norway's total yearly oil consumption. Uh, we wrote reports, nobody cared, nobody read them. Uh, so it was not until uh, uh, with Ratu and Madani, who got the task of, of uh, monitoring or recording uh, the oil spills all the way from Morocco across the Atlantic to uh, the West uh, Indies. Now uh, <laughs> they were able to uh, catch the world's attention. So uh, the crew, they were, they were uh, invited to uh, hearings in Congress, in all kinds of uh, fora, and now I'm uh, I know what I'm talking about, because here I am an expert. <laughs> now we got the Oslo Convention, we got the London Convention, we got the Paris Convention, we got the load on top system, we got all kinds of precautions. So I dare say that now oil pollution of the world oceans is practically solved. We still have occasional uh, spills, accidents, but on the whole, the problem is solved. Thanks to the man we just saw. He was the man who recorded the pollution. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Mariette Nergor the Norwegian ambassador to Morocco. Thank you so much for inviting me to this event, celebrating the birthday 
of the great Norwegian explorer Thor Heyerdahl. In fact, this event marks also the ending of a year of celebration in Morocco of the 50 years since this well-known uh, expedition of Thor Heyerdahl, Ra 2, left from the coastal city of Morocco, Safi. We were supposed to have an itinerary exposition of photos and memories from that expedition in several coastal cities in Morocco this year. But unfortunately, due to the circumstances and the pandemia of COVID-19, we were not able to do that, but we had uh, to do it virtually on Facebook. And there we had a lot of testimonies uh, from uh, Monsieur uh, Madani, who participated in that exp expedition himself, but also from others who uh, had got to meet uh, Mr. Tour Heyerdahl in Morocco and um, uh, got to, 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 to learn uh, about the expedition. And this uh, virtual exposition got a lot of attention in Morocco. And the whole uh, history of that uh, expedition revealed in an extraordinary way some of the bonds existing between our two countries, two, two nations so much dependent on the Atlantic Ocean. Thor Heyerdahl was in many ways a precursor for the ideas about the importance of keeping the ocean clean and sustainable for future generations and people of different nationalities and origins and religions living together and uh, promoting a peaceful uh, understanding and peaceful world. These are also objectives and agendas that uh, Norway uh, is working together with Morocco to achieve. I wish you all the best for the celebrations of the memory of the great Tour Heyerdahl, which turns out to have a special significance for the bilateral relationship between our two countries, Norway and Morocco. Thank you so much. Hello, everybody. My name is Madani Bekwani. I am the working crew member of our expedition. I had the honor and the privilege to meet the late Thor Herman when he and his multinational crew were preparing the Ratu expedition in the historic Safi, city of Safi in western Morocco. I was at the time the general manager at the Hotel Atlantic, where the group was staying. I became very quickly quite close to the crew members and particularly to Thor Herbal, whom I admired for his conviction and strong motivation to rebuild the ship and get it on the water again. I was myself interested in the work they were carrying out on a daily basis and in a nice and friendly atmosphere. The chance I had was when I heard that one of the crew members had a family urgency that forced him to leave the rest of the crew to get back home and be near his family. Whilst I was very happy when the head of the tour 
the expedition offered me to be on board the Ratu in the replacement of Abdullah Jibreel from Chad. I did not realize the responsibility I am facing and did not think of the risk that could happen in the team. In fact, I was only saying myself then the only Moroccan on the board and proud to represent my country in Morocco among the other nationality and the native banner. I got myself preparing and left my job at the hotel to cross over the Atlantic Ocean with the other crew members. All the populous floating Egyptian ancient boat with a little chance to reach the other side of the sea. I enjoyed journey without hesitation. The expedition which left the port of Safi on the 17th May 1970. Our leader has assigned to each of us a responsibility and mine was to carry out some sample from the sea to evaluate the damage that could affect the environment, especially that we were sailing under the flag of the United Nations. Therefore, during 57 days of navigation, with a very limited ancient sea instrument, a strict sharing of green cable water, plus that small selection of food in order to survive the crossing of the ocean till we reach our final destination in Barbados on the 12th July 97. When you are now young, with no family responsibilities, you don't really evaluate the risk of fear and fear. The objective was to arrive at destination with the little damage and certainly still alive. I must admit that the crossing of the Atlantic was not a piece of cake because we had to face tough, big waves. Most of that, we lost our cheap leather and had to get rid of some goods we invited from Safi. Many food, earthing, wares, and few other heavy goods because the populous boat got dumpy. We made the ship soaking a little bit. The monkey and the pigeon, named respectively Safi and Sinbad, we compacted from Safi, were having a fun, looking to us, at us, or praying, till we arrived in Barbados, where an important official delegation was waiting for us, plus many small boats full of people waving to us with a warm welcome. The Premier Minister of Barbados was there to welcome us too. All of us being happy to arrive alive and proud for his scientific achievement and a formidable adventure. This has given to Hebron and his crew a very special acclamation and recognition from all over the world. This includes a reception and designated headquarters by the former General Secretary, late Messer Yudan. Without forgetting the exceptional reception at the Royal Palace event, 
by his majesty, the King Hassan Shikam of Morocco, from whom all of us received some honorable medals of this, this, this distinction. We have also been invited to the presidential palace in Cairo to receive medals from the ruler of Egypt, Jay Jamal Abdullah. Now, that I am the only Ratu to remember alive. I have a special thanking of my colleague and friends of the expedition. With a special remembrance once for our leader, Dr. Thor Herbal, one of the greatest scientific researchers in the world. Because without his care and navigation skills, I would not be here today speaking to you and might have ended in the bottom of the deep blue Atlantic Ocean. Thanks to God and to all those who believe in the right to expedition and remain possible. And gratitude to the country division for giving me this opportunity to speak to you. It was an honor for me to be part of the Ratu expedition. Thanks to you all. Thank you. Azuli Fillaun. Assalamu alaikum. Good evening. Uh, dear Thor, dear Bettina, dear Ingrid, and dear all members of the Kontiki Museum, dear colleagues, ambassadors, representing the crew member of the Rat 2, and dear friends. Tonight, I recall the younger I was in Morocco in the 70s when I used to watch at the picture of the Ratu expedition. They were on magazine or on TV in Morocco. And uh, today I'm uh, in front of uh, Torre Yardel family. And uh, behind me, there's the Ratu boat. Wow, <laughs> I feel very privileged tonight. It's indeed a privilege for the embassy of the Kingdom of Morocco in Norway to celebrate today with Norwegians, with Moroccans and friendly country, two important anniversaries and to recall those historical moments we have in common. These 15th and 106th anniversaries are the occasion for us to recall a very fundamental element of human history. The fact that human history is before anything and above all a history of migrations. Ratu expedition is the scientific demonstration that humans have been traveling from a continent to another for a thousand years. Ratu's expedition is the demonstration that our present is the hair of millennial encounters, millennial cultural interactions and transfer of knowledges and technologies throughout the, the ages. In this sense, we are all the heirs of old human societies that have been built on ancient exchanges and inclusive melting pot traditions. This celebration today makes us better remember what we collectively owe to migrations in terms of creativity, dynamism, and civilization. Celebrating together the Ratu expedition and the memory of Thor Heyerdahl is celebrating together the idea that encounters and exchanges are our real, real DNA, that diversity is actually our real identity, and that living together is not an ethical nor a political decision, but simply a way of life. Dear friends, I'm glad tonight, and particularly glad tonight, that Norwegians from Moroccan origin 
answered positively to my invitation. I wanted your participation to this event because sometime some in the Moroccan community in Norway expressed the feeling that Morocco, their country of origin or birth country of their parents is very far from Norway, very far from what they experience daily in Norway, socially and culturally. And maybe sometimes some of them may feel that it is too far to be handled properly. And this feeling makes some of them believe that they will not manage to cross the mental distance between our two cultures and our different social behaviors. The Ratu expedition is a fantastic example that they, they can rely on to heal this feeling. It shows that whatever far geographically human beings may be, whatever different they may look superficially, we all have a common past and thus what we have in common is older, bigger, stronger, and wider than our differences. The expedition is in itself shows that by working together, we can reach great goals. The crew was a group of eight persons from different cultures, different languages, and different beliefs. They were even from very different political ideologies. You will discover in a few minutes the, the photo exhibition. At first glance, those persons actually look uh, very different. But if you look carefully at their eyes, then you will realize that they have the same look. A look full of passion, full of conviction, and, in, and with the same infinite thirst for, for adventure. And those are what, in the, in the end, make them look the same. This is my mes message tonight to the Moroccans in Norway. Nobody is different. When we share common values, common convictions, and common passion, we are the same. And we are not alone anymore. This is what Ra2 Expedition is about. And this is what we pay tribute to tonight. The Mediterranean Sea had Ulysses and its uh, Odysseus. The Atlantic Sea now has Thor Heyerdahl and his companion of the Ratu. Thank you very much. Tiago Genovese visited these Aymara Indians to find boat builders willing to come with us to Morocco in Africa and help to build Ra 2. Four Indians agreed to come together with a Bolivian interpreter. They expected to find Africa on the other side of their own lake. They must believe a magic carpet has flown them to Safi in Morocco in a matter of hours. From this ancient Phoenician port, Tor Hayadal, has sailed the previous year. Now he wants the Indians to build Ra 2 from 12 tons of papyrus reeds he has transported from Lake Tana in Ethiopia. They find these reeds are even bigger and better than their own on Lake Titicaca. They rope thousands of reeds together into two huge bundles. Each bundle is lashed independently, using only a single spiral rope, and as normal with them, a central bundle disappears from sight as the long ropes are pulled tight. A further bundle is added on top to each side to make a wider deck. After six weeks' work, Ra 2 is nearing completion. The Indians from Lake Titicaca are so eager to rejoin their families that they use only two-thirds of the available reeds. The boat they make is much smaller than Ra 1. 
ten feet shorter, in fact, with far less volume than Heyerdahl has intended. Ra, too, is first launched in dry land and is navigated through the streets of Safi by Norman Baker, the expedition pilot. A ship like something out of ancient Egypt, but built by South American Indians. The wife of the local pasha baptizes Ra too in goat's milk. <laughs> Heyerdahl's hopes are high, but he still has the bitter memory of his previous boat having failed. Under the flag of the United Nations, Ra too slides down the slipway, dry as blotting paper. She floated like a paper swan on top of the waves. After 10 days in the harbor, we left port and sailed into the open Atlantic, heavily loaded with six tons of cargo and superstructure. For two days, we drove southwards along the African coast with good wind and high speed. We made an average of four knots, doing 95 nautical miles in 24 hours. Norman could also confirm that the islands were very near and that we had entered American shipping lanes. We were lucky to escape any hurricane. Our deck had remained at sea level the whole of the last month. But we were not sinking any further. We expected to see it any moment. 